All right, we can get going now. Thanks for waiting. So we're still talking now about uh, crime measurement issues, and hopefully we can finish up with this one pretty quick here. And um, what we're still talking about is the difference between official measures of crime and unofficial measures of crime. We already talked about the idea that official measures of crime measure what officials are doing. And that's one way to see if crime is happening. If you're a sociologist looking at your society, you can say, well, what are the cops doing? What are the courts doing? And so we mentioned that arrests uh, statistics and court statistics uh, are the main sources of official data. But as we talked about, those are just uh, data on what the officials are doing. So when cops arrest people, that's data. That's who they arrested. When courts convict people, that's data. What if that data tells us accurately about crime or not is another question. And we talked about that, that it's, uh, when it comes to arrest, that's not a perfect uh, measurement of crime because sometimes cops arrest people that didn't do anything or they don't arrest people more often that did do something. So it's not a good, uh, good measurement necessarily, but it can tell us something. And we'll talk about what it can tell us. And remember, the index crimes, the, t the top eight uh, of violent crimes, are an important measurement of uh, crime itself, as we'll talk about. Court statistics, measuring who's gone through the courts or not, is another way of saying, what are the officials up to? It's sort of like, uh, it's an indirect way, because crime is happening, the officials are responding to it, and how the officials respond doesn't tell us exactly what's happening with crime, but it tells us something. Um, and so, what about unofficial? We said if we really wanted to know, for example, you know, how much uh, illegal drug use was happening at this college, asking the cops wouldn't really give us an accurate picture. But we could ask people themselves to report on their own behavior, self-report studies. And um, as you correctly wondered, would that be accurate information? If people are themselves are talking about their own criminal behavior, would that be accurate? Because we probably would suspect that people might lie on such um, surveys. But I really want to stress to you that lying is not the problem. Lying is not a problem for self-reports. Why is it not a problem? Well, surveys, if you know them, if you've ever taken one, if it's a well-done survey, if it's done correctly, and the ones that we use for this purpose are done correctly, if it's done correctly, it should be completely anonymous and confidential. If a survey asks you to say who you are, it's probably not done correctly. You're not supposed to give any identifying information of who you personally are on the survey. It's anonymous. So what we're talking about here is the reliability and validity of self-report. Is it reliable? Like, are people going to tell the truth or not? Or no, well, validity is, do they tell the truth? If, so, if you ask somebody, do you, have you ever stole, and they say yes, and somebody else never stole, and they say no, that would be a valid measurement of those two people's crime. But if they're lying, maybe it's not valid. So is it valid? Is it reliable? And when it comes to this question of um, lying, um, it's anonymous, so that's a word you should know, and confidential. <laughs> Surveys are. Anonymous means you no name, you don't put your name on there. And if your name's not on there, do you really have a reason to lie? If somebody says, hey, have you ever done drugs, and you didn't give them your name, you could say, well, yeah, I've done drugs or not. Um, so one, but still, people might be suspicious or you know paranoid. So uh, anonymous isn't always enough. Confidential. That's what a good survey should say on it. It should say we are not giving out the results of this survey to anybody. And you should. I want to tell you that in sociology, there's a thing called research ethics, meaning you know what's the sort of right and wrong when it comes to research. And I'm talking about like the right way to do a survey. Well, it would be wrong to tell people, I'm not going to divulge information about you. I'm not going to tell the cops about you. And then you did anyway. 
you would be harming the whole profession of sociology because sociology sometimes asks people very sensitive stuff about their lives. And we want them to give us truthful answers. And we don't want to call them out and identify them as people because that's their business. But we need the data about them. And if somebody, some sociologist goes going around saying, I'm not going to tell anybody what you told me, and then they did, well, then nobody's going to want to talk to sociologists and give information. So a good sociologist should say, if I'm asking about illegal behavior, like what drugs you've done, what crimes you've done, I will, as a sociologist, go to jail before I will tell the cops what you told me. So if the cops say, for example, we know you did a survey on drug use at Yuba College, and we want to know all the people who said yes, they've used meth, will you give it to us? And we're going to arrest you because you're obstructing justice if you don't tell us who used meth. A good sociologist, if they collected this data and told people, I'm not going to tell, should say, I'll go to jail then. I'm not giving you the information. And some sociologists have gone to jail before they would give the authorities the confidential information they got from people. So if you're really doing a good survey and saying this is anonymous, I'm not even asking your name, it's confidential, I'm not giving out the information to anybody, what they say is I'm only going to give out the aggregate information. So I will tell the cops, like 75% of my respondents didn't use meth, 25% did, but I'm not, I don't even know who the 25% are, who those people are, it was just in my data. And if you come and try to get my data or figure out who these people are, I'm not going to give it to you. So, um, it's supposed to be anonymous and confidential. And so if you've done that, hopefully the people filling out the survey are confident enough that I can tell the truth here, and it's not going to come back and get me personally, because it's just data that's being used by social science. And people, it turns out, are pretty trusting of researchers. When I say lying's not a problem, they've tested this. So there have been what are called reliability studies of these self-report surveys. And one of the most used self-report surveys is one called Monitoring the Future. It has an N of uh, 100,000. N, as we're going to learn, if you don't already know, is it stands for number. The number of people in your study. So anytime a scientist is doing a study, the number of things they studied is their N. And in this, in this survey, the N is 100,000. It's, it's called Monitoring the Future because they go to high schools. This survey goes every couple of years, every two years. It goes to American high schools. It surveys 100,000 American students. And it asks them all kinds of questions about the future, their future. Like, what do you think you're going to do when you grow up? Are you going to go to college? Are you going to join the military? Um, you know, what do you, how do you think you'll get married? Those kinds of things. But it also asks things about their, their current and their past. Like, do you smoke cigarettes? Have you ever stolen anything? Do you ever smoke pot? Do you ever do illegal? So it's asking all kinds of stuff. And it does get into some serious criminal, you know, it gets into some criminal behavior. So sociologists like to use this. Also, it gets into things that we could call status crimes. A status crime is only a crime because of the age of the person. So things like smoking cigarettes if you're under 18, or smoking marijuana, and things like that. And it asks about those. And those are very helpful as a sociologist because we want to know things like, are kids who do bad, you know, quote unquote bad stuff when they're young, are they more likely to do it later? Or what explains if somebody was into doing that then and they don't do it now, what, what could explain that? So having this data on young people and their behavior is very helpful to sociologists. But you might worry that kids are lying on that. Well, these reliability studies do what's called uh, test-retest studies. So one way you can see if people are lying or not is to give them the same set of questions twice at different times. And the idea here is if people lie, they don't really remember what they said when they were lying because it was just made up. So if we give people a survey and then we come back like five months later, six months later, and give them the same survey, test, retest, we surveyed you, then we resurveyed you. If the results are basically the same the second time, then that tells the researchers, you know, people are reliable. They're saying the same thing on both surveys. They're not, if, if you're lying, you might be unreliable. I'm all over the place. But if you're serious, then, I mean, if you're telling the truth, you're more likely to be consistent. 
And these test week test studies keep showing that people are consistent. Another way you can test it is what's called inter item <laughs> reliability. An item in this case is a question on a survey. A survey you know, has many questions on it, but each question on the survey is an item. And you can test to see if people are consistent across items, right? So if you have a long survey of like 100 questions, and at one point in the survey you ask something like, have you ever used meth? Yes or no? And another part of the survey you ask something like, when you use meth, uh, what do you like to do or something, you know, eat or whatever. If they said in the first one, you know, I never use, have ever used meth. And then on the second one, they go, I like to, you know, go out and party when I use meth. Well, that's inconsistent. You said up here, you didn't do it. And down here, you're saying, this is what I like to do when I do it. So that kind of inconsistency, again, would suggest lying that people are just making stuff up or just filling out answers randomly or something. But again, the inter-item correlation or reliability is very consistent. People say up here, I don't use meth, and down here, I never use meth, so no, I don't have anything I like to do. Um, and so we, we're pretty confident, very confident, that they're not lying, that people are just accepting that they're not going to hurt me if, if I'm telling the truth, so I'll tell the truth. There's another reason that we trust these surveys as, as social scientists, and that's the fact that lying cancels out. So some people do lie because it goes both ways. So some people do lie. So some kids on the, on the survey will say, I've never smoked pot, and they, they're high right now on pot. And other people on the survey will say, oh, yeah, I smoke 10 blunts a day. And they've never smoked any marijuana and have no idea what marijuana is, but they're trying to look cool. But those cancel out because the ones that he didn't, but he really does, and the ones that he does, but he really doesn't, but in terms of the numbers, we got the right number. One did and one doesn't. And so it turns out with that kind of lying, and they've, they've done uh, some surveys where they told people to lie. That's an interesting way to get reliability, is they say, uh, give us the wrong answer to the question, and then, but you still get the right number, because if you say I smoke pot and you don't, and this other guy says, so anyway, there's different ways to check the reliability and, and test the reliability, and social scientists are sure that that's not the problem. Lying is not the problem. But there are other problems with this method. The real problem, sample size, is a problem. So anytime you're surveying, you can't survey everybody that you're trying to understand better. We'll learn about this later when we talk about the research process, but the, the people you're trying to understand better, that's called your universe or your population. And you can't talk to all of them because there's too many of them. So anytime you're studying a population, you've got to just take a sample out of them, a little group of them, and say, I'm going to study these people. And hopefully what I found out about these people are true, is true for this larger group that I took them from. So a sample, you're taking a smaller group. So your big N, your total N of everybody, so like if you were trying to study Yuba College students, there's, let's say there's 6,000 total Yuba College students. I don't need to type up 6,000 surveys and give out 6,000 surveys. That's way too many, it's way too expensive, and it's not necessary because the way statistics work is if I can find out what's true for like a small sample, I can extrapolate and extend it to the larger group. So let's say I just get like 200 Yuba College students to talk to me about their drug use. Maybe in that 200 students, I can get an accurate picture of the total group. So you have to use samples. This is a big sample size, 100,000. The, the Monitoring the Future study surveyed 100,000 people. That's a huge survey. Have you ever looked at the paper or something and it says, you know, like right now we're in election year, and they say something like, well, 50% of people say they're going to vote for Biden, and 48% say they're going to vote for Trump or something. How do they know that? Do they ask every American who they're going to vote for? No. They do a little survey, a poll. And they ask how many people, how many people do you think, like if, the, if CNN is going to tell you that 50% of Americans favor Trump, 
How many people do you think they talk to? What would be the right end, do you think? Take a guess, or maybe you know, based on statistics. If you've ever taken statistics, they teach you about sample size and how big of a sample you need to get accurate statistics. But how many would you need people to talk to, do you think, to find out? So there's 300 million Americans. I don't know how many vote. Let's say 100 million Americans are regular voters. And we're going to try to predict what the 100 million Americans are going to do based on how many people do we need to talk to. Well, a common sample size is only 1,500 people. If you can just get 1,500 people to talk to you, if it's a good sample, if it represents the whole country, if it has all the states represented and different parties and things like that, if it's a good sample that really looks like the country, then these 1,500 people can represent the 300 million that we're trying to understand better. So 1,500 is a common sample size. So we can kind of put that here. 1,500 is more common. And sometimes 1,500 is like the standard for statistics. But that's why uh, this sample is so big. Well, they want 1,500 in each category. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. But when you're talking to 100,000 high school students, um, they're all pretty much the same age, right? Or age range. But then we have a lot of differences among them. Race differences, class differences, regional differences, gender differences. Uh, and so if I'm trying to study this 100,000 people or high school students, I want to, and I want to make a comparison, like I want to see, for example, well, which types of Yuba College students are more likely to, to use meth? So I found out that 25% use it, but are like Latino men more likely to use it than white men? Or are white women more likely to use it than black women? How will I know? I have to break out my sample. I have to look at what did the black women say? What, and, and on these surveys, you, have, you usually ask these background questions, like what's your race, what's your class, what's your gender, your age? And you can use those to then see, are their answers connected with who they are sociologically, their race, class, and gender, and things like that. And sometimes to make those comparisons, you need at least 1,500 in each group. So I need 1,500 Latino women. I need 1,500 older black women. I need 1,500 young Latino men. I need, and so it's called oversampling. They have this big oversample so that they can do these other kind of comparisons within the sample. But even if you have 100,000 people and you ask about crime, let's say we want to know about crime of these 100,000 people. And we ask them, have you ever murdered anyone? Let's say they tell the truth, like we're saying, everyone's telling the truth. But zero people in there say they've ever murdered someone. And that even with 100,000 people, the chances that you caught a murderer in your net, like you went out with a net and got 100,000 people, are there any murderers in my net? There might not be. And even if everyone told the truth on your survey, nope, never murdered then my, end, my number of how many people are murderers is zero. But there are some murderers, right? So my sample just wasn't big enough. If I was able to survey all Americans and ask, have you ever murdered somebody, there would be a few people saying yes, if they're all telling the truth. But in a 100,000 sample, I just don't have any murderers in there. I might not have any rapists in there. I might not have any armed assaulters in there. If I ask about marijuana use, how many of you use marijuana? A lot of people in there said they, yes. Have you ever smoked cigarettes? Yes. You know, have you ever jaywalked? Have you ever, you know, vandalized something that wasn't yours? You know, have you ever taken something from a store? Have you ever shoplifted? Those are common crimes. And in your net of 100,000 people, you may well have a lot of people in your net that have done those things. And if they're telling the truth, you're going to get accurate figures. But if you're asking about, have you ever murdered? Have you ever raped? Have you ever armed assault, you know, assaulted somebody with a firearm? No, no, no. And so you get, an, you get a figure of zero. But it's higher than that. It's somewhere higher than zero. So these samples aren't good. So these are good for common, non-serious crime. When you ask people about their crime, their common crimes, their misdemeanors, we could call them, you get pretty accurate figures from self-report studies. People are willing to tell you about their 
misdemeanors. And they and if you have good sampling, you can get a pretty accurate figure. So 25% of your sample says they've used illegal drugs. You can be pretty confident that that's about right, that about 25% of people use illegal drugs. But if you ask about murder and rape and assault, that's not, you're not going to get accurate figures there. So the, the index crime, remember the first eight offenses on the U Uniform Crime Report, murder, assault, rape, those kinds of things. So this is good for serious violent crime. If you want to know about serious violent crime, using the official data is probably going to get you closer to the truth than if you're trying to use, you know, self-report data. On the other hand, if you're trying to find out about the everyday crimes that everybody and a lot of people do, then the arrest statistics are not good, because as we've talked about, the cops tend to focus on poor people. And we know that rich people also do a lot of these misdemeanor kind of crimes as well, and some of the serious ones too. So we want to have a, uh, and so if we're trying to study the common crimes, and we want an accurate picture, not one that's biased by our law enforcement system, then asking people themselves. Another key one, though, is victimization surveys. So this one asks, self-report asks about, I mean, they're both self-report, but monitoring the future asks about your crimes. What have you done? So victimization surveys ask, what has happened to you? Have you ever had something taken from somebody? Have you ever had something vandalized? Have you ever been assaulted? Have you ever been raped? Have you ever been murdered? I guess you couldn't answer that one. But, um, but those give us another data point, because if we're sociologists trying to figure out which crime is out there, if the cops say, no, nope, no nope, crime, we haven't been arresting anybody, and the victimization surveys are like, yeah, I'm getting assaulted all the time, and all my stuff's getting taken, then we can say, well, the cops just aren't doing anything. There is crime happening. They're just not doing anything about it. And I saw somebody said this the other day. They're like, uh, oh, crime is down. This is on Facebook. They're like, the figures say that crime is down, but that just shows the cops aren't doing anything. And in a way, they might be right in that if you were only using arrest statistics as your measurement of crime and they were down, that wouldn't be enough for you to conclude crime is down. It could just be the cops are sitting around not doing anything. But that's why sociologists also use this other data point, like victimization surveys. So if the cops are saying there's no crime, or sometimes the cops say there's tons of crime, and we had to arrest hundreds of people all the time. And then we ask people, is crime happening to you? And they're like, no, it's much better now than it used to be. Well, that raises the question. Why are the cops saying crime's out of control, but the people themselves are saying it's fine? So we need both sort, sources of data, is what I'm saying. And we definitely need this kind of data if we're trying to understand common, everyday, non-serious kinds of crime. And we definitely need this kind of data if we're trying to understand the serious violent forms of crime. So they go hand in hand, and we try to use both. Now, it's true that the news media, when they report on crime, don't always use both. They typically just report the arrest statistics. And that can be quite misleading. And like I said, there's a culture of fear where our news media and our politicians, they all kind of benefit from having people be scared. As long as you are worried that your fellow man is out to get you, then a politician can try to get elected based on that. You've got to elect me if you want to be safe. And the companies can sell you stuff saying, you've got to buy my stuff if you want to be safe. So our news media and our political system favor people being afraid of crime. But sociologists studying the actual situation have shown that, like I said, crime's actually much lower in America than it used to be. I've seen a lot of people complaining about America's in decline, and I, I saw a guy on Facebook today say, I used to be in the Navy, I signed up to die for this country, but the country now, that it, as it is, I would never sign up to fight for it. And, I, and this guy's a, a white guy, like my age, and I'm like, What's so bad about the country now? What was so great about it 10, you know, 20 years ago when you joined the military? And now, like, I, I'm trying to understand why is he so upset about things? And I think in my, in my mind, he's just been influenced by the rhetoric, by the media telling him America is much worse than it used to be. But when it comes to crime, America is much better than it used to be. We should be patting ourselves on the back. America is actually a safer place than it used to be. There's less chance of you being victimized on the streets 
of, of the United States than was true in the 60s and 70s and the and 80s especially. And so, uh, so that's one of these cases where the, the rhetoric, the political, the things people are saying, the reality that's been constructed that people think is true uh, doesn't match the empirical reality, what we actually observe in the data. And so I was talking about that, that the basic data are telling us a good story, which is that in 19, if we compare 1980 to 2024, crime was pretty stable. It went up in the late 80s. It reached a peak in 1993. And ever since then, it's basically been going down. Uh, and uh, this, by the way, is serious violent crime, is what I'm talking about here. The arrest statistics mainly, but also victimization surveys, all suggest that serious violent crime peaked in 1993. And that if we compare today's data, we see that today's data looks more like back here. So for a long time, criminal criminologists were trying to understand what happened here. When it comes to criminalists, so what, what, so criminologists are a type of sociologist. They study crime. They focus on crime and crime measurement. And there tends to be conservative criminologists and liberals. And they tend to have different explanations when they're looking at data to try and understand what's going on here. And if you are a conservative criminologist and you were trying to explain why did crime go down? Why did, was it so high in 1993 and what caused it to go down? In other words, if you're trying to understand the crime drop, why did it happen? What would conservatives attribute that to? Uh, conservatives say it's tough on crime policies. So things like more cops on the street, stricter sentences, stricter penalties. If you ask a criminologist, you know, why did crime go down in America after 1993? A lot of conservative criminologists would theorize, their theory would be, it's because we got tougher on crime. Well, is that true? Well, 1993 was when this started to go down. 1995 is when California passed the California's three strikes bill. Three strikes is a, a crime policy in California that says if you commit three violent felonies, then, uh, then you go away for life. It used to be, you know, it depended on different things and somebody might have many felonies and not go away for life. But California said in 1995, we're getting tough on crime, no more forgiveness, no, no more all these second chances. If you commit three violent felonies, you go to prison for life. And that was considered one of the toughest crime bills ever in the United States. Florida passed its bill. Florida's three strikes a few years later. 1996, I think it was. Well, if you're a criminologist, a conservative criminologist, and you're saying tough on crime policies are what bring crime down, this doesn't really back you up because crime was already going down. Crime started going down in 1993. And then California passed, and Florida passed, and crime kept going down after that. But the data isn't supporting here this idea that if you just get tough on crime, that's how you bring crime down. What about liberals? What do they say is the key? If you're a liberal like Barack Obama or myself, what would you say is the key to bringing down crime? Well, we tend to say it's opportunity. When people have legitimate opportunities, like good jobs and good education and can go do those things, they're going to prefer to do those things to get ahead in America than going and doing bad stuff to people. So more opportunity, more hope you know, is what uh, Obama used to say. So, you know, better economy is what a lot of uh, liberals would say. If you can just improve the job situation and the economic situation, the housing, the medical care, then people will not turn to crime. Well, does the uh, data support that? 
So if you look at the unemployment data, so uh, unemployment should be, well, so let's, yeah, let's call it unemployment. Unemployment should track, if you were a liberal, the high crime would be here and high unemployment. So unemployment line, is it tracking with the, with the crime line? In other words, as unemployment goes up, more and more people are unemployed, does the crime rate go up? And as more and more people get employed, does the crime rate go down? And there's some support for that. Obviously, 1993 was the peak of a recession. America's economy, a uh, member from two American families, they lost their jobs due to globalization. But then at the beginning of the film, there was this recession. And so even if you were trying to get a job, it was hard for everybody. And so 1993 was one of those bad periods. And the economy started to improve. Unemployment went down, as you saw in two American families. Over the course of the 90s, things got better for the families and for the rest of America. And more and more people started going back to work. And people said, yeah, America's back, and the stock market's back up, and all these things. So there's some support there that as the economy was bad, crime went up, but as the economy improved, crime went down. But 2008 is a problem for this theory. 2008 was the Great Recession, the biggest recession since the Great Depression, when lots of people lost their homes and lots of people lost their jobs and it was a huge economic crisis in America. Did the crime rate shoot back up? when lots of Americans lost their jobs? No, kept going down, still kept going down. So liberals say if you, if jobs, you know, people lose their jobs, crime's gonna go back up. Well, it didn't. And so some people are saying maybe, so neither side can really explain, why did crime go down? Was it because we got tough on crime? Maybe not. Was it because things got better for working people? Maybe not. So how do we explain this data? We see this thing here, this big rise in crime. And so some people have said, maybe we shouldn't be trying to explain a, a, a drop in crime. Maybe the better way to look at this data is to see this. It was at a certain level in the early 80s, and now it's at a certain level here. And so maybe this is just what we call a crime spike. A spike is when the data jumps really high for suddenly. Like if you're looking at an EKG or something, or a, an, a seismometer for earthquakes, you know, it's steady all the time, and then boom, 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 boom that earthquake. So what happened here? What was causing this fluctuation of the data in early 1990s? What was going on in America that suddenly made crime go up? So instead of trying to explain a gradual decline in crime, we need to try and understand this steep uptick in crime that happened in the late 80s and early 90s. And some people say this was the height of the crack epidemic, crack wars. You guys are too young to remember, but when I was a young person in college, the streets where a lot of crack was being, a lot of crack cocaine was coming into the country. Well, cocaine was coming in, and people were turning it into crack. They were turning it into the highly purified cocaine and selling it on the streets. And there was whole music about it. I mean, the, the whole genre of rap, gangster rap, began to be created. A lot of these guys we now think of, you know, were from that time. Um, you know, like Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre, and those people were from that time of when there were drug posses on the streets with AK-47s shooting at each other on the streets of the United States and drive-by shootings and mass killings. So you had a high murder rate because of all this shooting of drug war, drug, you know, drug gangs battling each other. Drug gangs aren't battling each other on the streets of the United States right now, but do you know another place on planet Earth where drug gangs are battling each other and people are getting shot and stuff like that? Is there another place anywhere in the in, in, in country, or not in the country, in the world, where drug cartels and gangs fight each other? Mexico. So one idea here is that America has pushed its crack wars, its drug problem, into Mexico. Mexico has been trying to tell America, your drug problem is causing problems for us, because the drugs go to the United States. That's where people use them. 
But the drug cartels, the drug gangs are fighting each other here. And they kill people and do all kinds of terrible stuff. And so can you, so Mexico at one time was asking the US, maybe you guys need to legalize drugs, do something to take the power away from the cartels. Because by having drugs illegal, you're creating this whole opportunity for organized crime. But if drugs were like, you know, diabetes drugs that you get from a pharmacy or something like that, then you'd be getting them from legitimate sources, not from uh, cartels and gangs. And so, and Mexico has liberalized its drug laws and tried to say, you know, we don't want people fighting and killing each other over drugs. If somebody wants drugs, you know, let them have some drugs, but let's not uh, have people, criminals, deciding who gets the drugs and how much they have to pay for them and stuff. Same thing happened in the United States. The United States tried to illegalize alcohol in the early 20s, and that caused all kinds of violence in the United States over who gets to sell the alcohol, because it didn't stop alcohol use to illegalize it. It just made it much more expensive and much more scary to use it, and so that allowed criminals to take over. Anyway, so maybe that's the explanation for the big crime rise in America, was America's drug policies led to this drug war in our streets, and then now our drug policies are pushing that drug war to Mexico streets, but that might be a better explanation than these liberal and conservative tendencies to explain crime purely in economic terms or in policy, you know, crime policy terms. Anyway, so, uh, but the good news is crime is lower than it used to be, and I think too many Americans are not aware of that. And we spend a lot of time talking about how much, how bad America is. But that's one place where you might be able to say, hey, we've made improvement as a society in terms of controlling our tendency to harm each other. Was there a question? Okay, so those are some ideas about crime me measurement. Another uh, idea I want to share about it is uh, community policing, because there's one other possible reason, and I think I'm compelled by this idea, how we police our streets, not just how we punish people once they commit crimes, but how you actually enforce the law can be a big, uh, I think, a big factor in whether people are violating the law or not. And community policing is kind of a newer idea. Um, there's really three paradigms here. Uh, I'm gonna try to be quick here. But the old, there's a traditional policing. There's modern policing. And then there's community policing. And uh, in some ways, this new community policing is really a return to this old style of traditional policing. Traditional policing is represented by the term COP. You might not know, but the term COP stands for Constable on Patrol. Constable, Constable on Patrol. Constable is an English term. If you go to England, they still use that word, constable. And if you know about English police, they are, they're called bobbies. I don't know if you've ever seen these guys with these funny round hats they wear. Bobbies in England are unarmed. The cop is unarmed. All he has is a little wooden club that he might need to use at times, but no firearm. And the constable on patrol, his job is to just alert the public when there's problems. So you patrol, you patrol a beat, walk a beat. A beat is a, a route, like a mailman's route. Well, a cop's beat is the route, the set of streets that he is in charge of. And this constable, his, he's not in charge of it in the terms of he enforces the law, but his job is to patrol it, to patrol the streets. And when there's a problem, to let everybody know, to blow a whistle or yell or wake people up at night to come out and deal with the problem. And that model is not, that's not what we've used in the United States for a long time. America has more of the modern policing. And that's represented, if you think of the LAPD, the Los Angeles, their famous police department in American history. They're the ones that beat up Rodney King, for example, which led to riots and you know various other cases of the LAPD. And so if we try to think of how, how did the LAPD operate and how was it different from constables on patrol? 
Well, they have, uh, you know, police cruisers, for example. So big cars. This guy's on foot. There's a big difference between patrolling your streets as a representative of the government when you're just on foot with other people versus if you're in a patrol car or you're on a horseback. Those are intimidating things. When you patrol the streets of a neighborhood and you're in a big, huge cop car with tinted windows, with mirrored sunglasses on the cop, it's like uh, Big Brother is watching you. The government's watching you and patrolling you, and you better be scared. Whereas when it's a cop on the beat, he's just a guy there, hey, Officer John, hey, how you doing? Everything okay? Yeah, everything's okay. And so the, this modern policing is more intimidating. The idea was to catch bad guys. So that's the goal of like LAPD is we're gonna find the people doing crime and we're gonna charge them with crime and we're gonna get them put away. And how do you do that? Well, you surveil people, you, you use you know night vision goggles and helicopters and all these other ways of trying to spy on people to catch them in the act of doing bad stuff, supposedly. And then once you get this evidence, you bring the evidence to the DA, the district attorney, and you say, we gotta charge these guys. Does that solve the problem when we catch bad guys? Like if you're trying to solve drug problems, does putting people in jail for drugs, does that get rid of drugs? Maybe not. I mean, it becomes like a revolving door. As a lot of cops will tell you, we arrest people, they get back out, they come back in, we arrest people again. And so this catching bad guys idea turns out not to be very effective. Are there other reasons why this model of um, you know, intimidation, intimidation and surveillance why that might not work. Like, can you imagine if you were trying to solve a murder in a community, you're the cops, and there's somebody's murdered, and there's a dead body on the street, and we come to the community in our police cruiser with tinted windows and mirrored sunglasses, and we get out of our car, and we ask the community, like, what happened here? Are we gonna get good evidence? What happens if you come into a community and ask people what happened, but you're all intimidating with your big cruisers, your big weapons, your mirrored sunglasses? Does the community help you solve the crime? Traditionally, that's what the LAPD and other law enforcement like this found, is the community don't see us as the good guys. They see us as big brother coming in to harass them. And so when crime does happen in the community, we ask, like, who saw what? People are like, didn't see nothing. No idea. So the cops can't solve the crime because no one will talk to them, no one will give up information. So as the cops, you're like, our goal is to catch bad guys, but the way we're trying to do it isn't even leading to that because people don't want to help us. People don't see us as the good guys. And so this isn't an effective policing model. So community policing became a new model that began to be promoted in the 90s of saying we need a different relationship between the cops and the community. Let's have cops on foot again. Let's have them uh, have uh, beats. So a particular street they walk, a particular set of streets. Um, cops on foot or bicycle, that's another common thing. If you go to downtown Sacramento, for example, you have bicycle cops. Well, cops on a bike is not as scary as cops on a horse, for example, or cops in a police cruiser. They're more, it's more friendly seeming, it's more regular seeming. And if it's, they're walking a beat, then you know the police. Those are the same guys I see every day. Hey, Officer John. Hey, Officer Bill. Hey, how you doing? How's your business going? Hey, is your kid you graduated from college yet? So they become part of the community. They're not just this thing that comes from outside the community into the community to patrol it. They are people that are there every day as part of the community. And instead of having this as a centralized station, if you know how police works, like on TV shows, I don't know if they're like that now, but when I was going up TV shows, the police start their day at the police station in downtown New York or downtown LA, and they all meet there and they say, okay, now let's go out there and, you know, solve crime. So they all leave their central station in downtown and go out all over the city. And that's why they are people that aren't known in the neighborhoods. They're just come from somewhere else to come patrol. But this says, let's have substations. Let's have um, neighborhood substations so that each neighborhood has its own 
police station. And if you have substations, not just one central police station, then people can say, well, this is our police station. This is for our community to protect our kids and our school yards and stuff like that. And instead of trying to catch bad guys as the main model or the main goal, main goal is to solve problems. So arresting people and putting them away doesn't have a good track record of actually solving problems it, at a community level. Like if you have, like I've mentioned, East LA and other places are persistently places with, with pro crime problems. Or if you look at like Linda, just right around here, there's a little, you know, more meth use probably in Linda than other parts of Marysville. So if you ask like, you know, how do we solve that problem? If you keep arresting people for using meth in Linda, I don't know if that gets rid of meth in Linda. We still have people using it, maybe even the same people. With drugs, you know, if you arrest the people selling it, they get put away, but then there's still people that want to buy it, so there will be other people stepping up to sell it. So it doesn't really solve the problem, but if you're trying to solve a problem, you might come at it a different way. I had a guy come speak to my classes. He was a community police officer. He said, when I started this work, I did not know cops wants to be a, a community police officer. All the cops, when they came to us and said, we're starting a new community policing program in our police station, all the guys were like, why would I do community policing? What am I, a sociologist? I got into crime, you know, being a cop because I want to stop crime and stop bad guys. And no, I don't want to do community policing social work or something like that. So all these cops are really skeptical and saying, we don't want to do community policing. And this guy was one of them. But he said, but they were offering extra money or something. So I said, okay, I'll try it. So he tries community policing. The first thing he was given was a beat. This is your community. And your job is to help these people in this community solve the problems in their community. So that means part of your job is asking the people in the community, what problems, guys, should we be solving here? Or how can we work together as the cops in the community to solve a problem here? So you need to tell me what you guys want solved. And they came to him and said, well, we have this problem. There's this alley. It was a group of owners of a, of a strip mall. You know, like Northfield Road has a lot of strip malls there because it's a strip. Field, the big main drag, and you got these malls, these little buildings that have multiple stores along the, the strip. And these buildings with multiple stores, one of them came to the community police officer and they said, well, we have a problem because the alley next to our um, strip mall has all kinds of drug use going on and prostitution going on. And that means people don't want to come shopping at our stores because they know they're going to see stuff they don't want to see in the alley there. So can you help us? What should we do about this dark alley where the crime problems go on? Well, the old model, what would the old model be? If store owners came to you and said, we got crime going on in the alley, the cops would be like, okay, we got to catch those guys. So we're going to set up a, a police cruiser across the street with night vision goggles and cameras, and we're going to get evidence of people selling drugs and doing prostitution. Well, once we get the evidence, we'll go down to the DA, we'll convince the DA that we need a warrant. And when we get a warrant, we can go arrest these people. And then when we arrest them, we'll take them to jail, and then, what? Then either they come back and do crimes later again, or other people come in, there's still prostitution and drug dealing going on in the alley. You've arrested people, you put people away, but we still have a problem. So how do you solve the problem? What would be a solution, can you think of? If you have a dark alley where drugs are going on, what would make it so that there wasn't drugs going on in that alley? Can you create a neighborhood watch? Neighborhood watch, maybe, or what else might make that dark alley not a good place for doing drugs? But you're right, neighborhood watch is an element of community policing. Getting the community itself to be part of helping to police it with regular people going out on patrols. But it's a dark alley. That's why there's crime going on. What would you do about a dark alley? An al you know, an alley with no lighting in it. Oh, add light. Add light. <laughs> like if you could put some lights up in the alley, then it's not going to be a place where people want to go and do drugs and, and do deals and stuff like that. It's just not an opportunity anymore. So that could solve the problem for those for that strip mall. But how do you do that? Because to get a, a light up, 
this cop said that was what we decided. We need lighting in the alley. But that meant, and it wasn't there. So how do we get it? I had to go to the store and collect funds from them to pay for the new wiring, to pay for the lighting. We had to go to the city and get permits for this. So it was like community organizing. If you're trying to organize a community to do something, you got to get different organizations and government entities to work together to get this to happen. And so the cops said, yeah, it's not catching bad guys. It wasn't patrolling and surveilling. It was going to different agencies and getting them to contribute what was needed to get this done. And once it was done, it really did solve the problem. And these people were so grateful to this cop. He said, the, the love I got from them for how we solved this problem was so much better than anything I ever got. Like, I thought I was a hero before, Mr. Hero, I'm gonna put bad guys away. And all I got was hatred from the community and people hating cops and flipping me off. And here I actually help people solve the problem and the community gave me love. And so I want to suggest to you that, uh, you know, this is a very functionalist idea that crimes are a sign of no community. If people are not treating each other as a community, if they're just a bunch of individuals out for themselves, then yeah, why not commit crime against each other? But if people are thinking and acting as a community, as a group of people that are trying to work together to make life better, then you wouldn't want to violate each other with crime. And it's not, crime is a sign of dysfunction, of people not having solidarity and social stability and shared values and shared norms and all the things we talked about in terms of making a community feel complete. And so community policing is kind of recognizing, I think, this idea that what, what's the opposite of crime is community, a group of people working together to protect each other. And, uh, and so if you can help create that as cops, then you're helping a community be stronger and less, you know, it's the opposite of that is what we have in, in a place like Linda, I think, and this community. Every man for himself, where people just go home, they close their doors, they watch the news that tells them how scary America is and how bad other Americans are. They don't want to leave, they get a bunch of guns in their house. I'm scared of all the other people, which to me is no way to live. It'd be a much better community if at night we had like farmers markets out on the street and festivals and people were leaving their homes to go be with each other in the community. And if you have that kind of community where people are actually with each other celebrating life, then criminals, people who want to like do bad stuff to each other, aren't going to be welcome there and aren't going to feel comfortable in there. Yeah, they might go somewhere else, but if all the communities are stronger, then eventually you get to a point where there isn't much opportunity for crime because communities are strong, they're watching out for each other, they have neighborhood watches, they have community problem solving and all of that. And so, uh, so but it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a catch-22. Do you need to have a strong community first in order to have good community policing? Or can you bring community policing into a neighborhood and help start creating community? I'm a little worried about cops being the guys that start a community. It'd be better to have community first and then integrate the cops into that. But, um, and so that's why maybe community policing isn't as uh, widespread as it might, as it could be, is because you know, a lot of places that don't have community. They have a bunch of fearful, divided people that don't want to come together and work together. So they can say, yeah, you go arrest those people and I'll be fine. Um, Anyway, so that's uh, functionalism and its view of crime and crime theories. Um, I haven't totally finished with functionalism because there's a whole other set of topics that functionalists are, that we're going to cover. Uh, so we've said that functionalism is all about social stability and social order, keeping people working together and on the same page, not committing terrible acts against each other and violating each other's expectations of each other. And so crime is one area they've studied because that's uh, you know, one of the places where you see that breaking down. But religion, the sociology of religion is what we're gonna get into now. Religion is another common, strong source of social Solidarity. Remember we said solidarity is shared things, shared symbols, shared beliefs, shared values, shared goals. If you want to have a group of people have those things shared, a religion is a great way 
to do that. Because that's what religions are in some ways. Is a collection of shared values, ideas, beliefs, symbols. And so functionalists are very interested in, well, what are religions and where do they come from and how do you create them and what is their function? What is the function of religion? Why do people have it? And I'm not going to only focus on the functionalist answer to this question, which is, you know, what is religion? All three of the perspectives, conflict theory, functionalism, and symbolic interactionism, have looked at this question, and they all have different answers to it. And so comparing the answers to that question is, I think, instructive and will help us understand the functionalist perspective. So let's start with Marx. Karl Marx is the founding father of conflict theory. He's the founding father of communism. In America, I always said communism was a terrible thing. And one of the reasons we said it was a terrible thing in America is because we said they're godless. And communists officially don't believe in God. They're scientists, they're atheists. And America, a lot of Americans are very religious people. And so America said we reject, a lot of Americans said I reject any kind of communist belief if it rejects my religion. And Karl Marx is famous for something he said, which is that religion is the opiate of the masses, the psi of the oppressed. It's a famous quote from Marx. Religion is the opiate of the masses. What's it mean, though? Seems like you guys want me to do all the talking. I still want you guys to try and Talk a little. What do you? What does that mean? Religion is the opiate of the masses. What's an opiate? It's a weird word. Anybody know it? So opiate is a derivative. You know, has to do with opium. Opium poppy. Opium poppy, the flower, purple flower. Do we know what drugs come from the opium poppy? Um, Opium is one, heroin. Um, it's a source of drugs, uh, the opium poppy. And people have been using the drugs from opium poppies for a long time. But what kind of drug is opium and heroin? Uh, by the way, we also have in America nowadays something called opioids. Opioids are synthetic. Opiates. So you can make it a laboratory. Synthetic means scientists make it in the laboratory. Real heroin, real opium, you get from an opium poppy. They actually take a blade and cut the stem and the sap that comes out of the poppy they use to make these drugs. But uh, opioids are the ones you can make in a laboratory. And those are things like Oxycontin. Um, and so we've had a real problem in America with the opioid crisis, people taking pills and overdosing and things like that. Fentanyl is another synthetic opioid. So they're, they're drugs, but what kind of drugs are they? They're known as uh, narcotics. There's different kinds of drugs. You may know about them. Some are like hallucinogens that make you see vision. Some are stimulants that make you all hyper. And some are sedatives that make you all tired and quiet and all that. But what do narcotics do? Narcotics are more than sedatives. They literally put you to sleep. People use narc to mean different things nowadays. But narcotic squads of police departments were set up to go after heroin. And what is it about heroin? What, what, uh, what does it do to you? And why is Marx comparing religion to being a narcotic? What does a narcotic do? It makes you close your eyes. makes you kind of fall asleep and dreaming. So half asleep. And dreaming is kind of how somebody is when they're really deep into a heroin high. They call it the nod. When somebody shoots up with heroin and they nod off, they're kind of half asleep. 
and they're dreaming and seeing beautiful visions, I guess. I've never done it. Um, but that's what Marx thought religion was like. Is that a good thing? Should people be take, nodding off with beautiful visions in Marx's view? Who are the masses? The masses are the working people, the workers. And remember, Marx felt that the working people need to wake up. They need to be woke, is the, the way people use it now. They need to wake up and challenge the powers that be. They need to wake up and know that they're being exploited by the capitalists. In Marx's view, the real way for workers to make their lives better is not to go to church. Church is where workers go because their lives suck, in his view, and church gives them this drug-like feeling. It takes away your pain. It's a painkiller. If you can go to church and hear the priest talking about how the meek shall inherit the earth and poor people one day, will get to go to heaven and sit by the throne of God, and so your poorness, your poverty today, don't worry about it. You're, you know, you're powerless today, you're meek and powerless, but don't worry, because when you die, everything will be much better. And Mark says, no, not when you die. Things can be better now if you would come to the union hall instead of to the church meeting, if you come to the political rally instead of, the, instead of praying. Don't ask God for help. You know, ask the powers that be here on earth or demand with the, your fellow man through collective action better treatment, better pay, for shorter hours, more weekends. That's how you're going to make life better for working people. But if you just go to church, what? You're not doing what the workers need to be doing to challenge the powerful. And so Marx says it's really a tool of the powerful. It's a tool of domination. Marx is saying the, the power elite, the ruling class, uses religion to keep the working people, to keep the masses from rebelling. It tells everybody, just be a good person, go to church, stop questioning things, just have faith, and you won't have to do anything. You can just pray and God will help you. In other words, it's saying just accept things as they are. Don't challenge the powers that be. It's interesting, this, this tool of domination was really started in the previous, before capitalism, and it's interesting that the word that was used for God, Lord, is the same word that you were supposed to use for your master if you were a peasant. So I have a Lord, and then I pray to a Lord, and the Lords are who are in charge. Now that system went away, the feudal system and the Lords and everything, but the capitalists, according to Marx, continue to promote this idea that if you want to be a good person, you should be a Christian and religious, and you shouldn't go be a communist or challenge the powers that be. You should just do what you're told. And so Marx says that the working people really, well, he also calls it the sigh of the oppressed. Here is where he's saying, I understand why working people do turn to religion. I mean, if your day is spent working in a factory 16 hours a day, and you barely have enough to eat, and your kids are not doing well, then this chance to go on a Sunday into a big, beautiful building with beautiful stained glass windows and hear a priest say beautiful things about the afterlife and stuff, um, he can understand, like, what, what is a sigh? A sigh is when you have no other choice. Like, I don't know what I can do. Well, at least I can go to church and pray. I mean, so a sigh is when you have no other alternative. And in the movie, Two American Families, by the way, she said that several times, like, what other choice do we have other than to, like, have faith in God? But Marx is saying, yeah, I understand why people feel this need to go to church and find some relief from their oppression, but you want people to wake up and join the working class movement, join a political movement, join a political party, not a religion, as a way to make your life better. And so that's why a lot of American people have rejected Marx and say, no, I want to be religious, and no, stop bad-mouthing my religion, and stop, uh, you know, saying I'm on a drug, when what I believe is, you know, I'm being a very faithful servant of the Lord and all. And so, so a lot of people have rejected Marxism and Marx on that basis. And Durkheim, the founder of functionalism, also thought Marx was looking at religion in the wrong way. So 
So conflict theory doesn't have that much to say about religion other than that it's this thing the capitalists use to control the working people. And once we wake working people up to communism, they will choose that as their faith and work for that heaven on earth rather than uh, some heaven in the sky. But what did functionalists say about it? What did Durkheim say? Well, he thinks Marx has misunderstood religion sociologically. He asks, what are the group functions not the individual, the, the psychological function. So this is uh, requires a little bit of explanation, but um, uh, function. So when Marx says religion is a drug, he's looking at how it makes the individual person feel when they're being religious. So you could say that Marx is really focusing on why does an individual person want to be religious? What's, what does it do for them? In a way, what Marx was asking is what is the function of religion for an individual person? And his answer is, well, it functions like a drug. It makes you feel better. It makes you feel a little bit dreamy. It makes you accept your situation. Um, it's like an escape. And that's why a lot of people say they don't want people doing drugs because you're escaping your reality rather than facing it and dealing with it. But, but if you're asking why an individual person would want to be religious, then you're not asking a sociological question. That's a psychological one. And if we were psychologists and Durkheim wasn't, we would be very interested in what does religion do for a person? Like, why do you want to be religious? How does it help you? What do you do with it? But as a sociologist, we have to ask not why does a person want to be a Christian, but why is there Christianity? Not why does somebody want to be a Jew, but why is there Judaism? Why is there Islam? Why is there Sikhism? Not why do you want to be a Sikh, or why do you want to be a Christian or be a Jew, if we want to, but why, what, why did these groups create these things? So he's asking about the group function. What does Judaism do for the Jewish people? What does Sikhism do for the Punjabi people? What does Islam do for Arabic people and Islamic people? So that's a sociological question, not a, uh, a psychological one. And so to study those, you have to study the whole group and ask, well, how did this group, what is this group, and where did it come from, and when did it start having this belief system, and why does it have, or what does it do with the belief system? And so Durkheim said, we need to go back to what he called the elementary forms of religion. So we need to go back to like prehistory and try to understand the first humans before there was Christianity, before there was Judaism, before there was Islam, there were humans. And did these humans have religion? Like, what do we mean by religion? What, what is it? And if there wasn't Christianity, what were people doing? And, uh, and so he's looking at the prehistory, prehistoric hunter and gatherer groups. So there's no written language. We don't have good records of these groups of people. But we do know that they had some kind of religious beliefs because, for example, they often would bury their dead with worldly objects and objects of beauty and art and things like that. And why would you do that if you didn't have some belief about the afterlife or something like that? So we know that these groups had beliefs, but we don't know uh, Durkheim in Durkheim's time. We weren't exactly sure what those beliefs were or why they would have them. Uh, and a lot of people thought they were animal worshippers. Europeans who worshipped Jesus and God were appalled at the idea that there were quote-unquote primitive tribes like American Indian groups 
that had as their thing that they supposedly worshipped would be an animal. Because if you're worshipping animals, that's like devil stuff, according to Christianity. And you shouldn't be worshipping animals. So why were these you know, native people, quote unquote, worshipping animals? And Durkheim says that's the wrong way to look at it. We need to understand what function would having like an animal as your symbol of your group. Like if you are the hawk people, why are you the hawk people? Does it mean you're worshipping hawks? Or does it mean you're worshipping your people and using hawk as the symbol of that? And so is it really accurate to say that Indian, like Native American groups that had animal symbols, were they really worshipping the animals? Or were they somehow creating a symbol that their group could have in common? A shared symbol of solidarity that made us know we are the hawk people. We are the people that worship, you know, that celebrate the hawk, and the hawk celebrates us. We'll talk more about that later, but that's what Durkheim's getting at is not what does it do for the individual to believe in hawkism or whatever, but why would a tribe of people create a symbol like a hawk and use it to organize who they are and their symbols and their practices? And that's asking more about the group function of religion, not the individual psychological need for religious feelings. So we'll come back to uh, Dirk time later. Um, where are we? Tuesday. So we'll see you on Thursday. All right, thank you.